you may be wondering, how is humidity measured? We have been discussing the types of humidity, okay, and we've been talking a lot about relative humidity um, in the last several slides, including how to calculate it. And you may be wondering, how is it measured? Okay, what instrument is used to measure humidity? Well, the sling psychrometer is one of the um, instruments for measuring humidity. And the sling psychrometer is made of two side-by-side -side thermometers that are connected to a handle. One of the thermometers is dry. This thermometer is called the dry bulb thermometer. And the other thermometer has a piece of cloth at the end that is dipped into water and it becomes wet. So that thermometer is called the wet bulb thermometer. So the wick is dipped in water and after that's done, the instrument, the sling psychrometer, is spun to ventilate air into the thermometers, which causes the water to evaporate, cooling the wet bulb. Recall that evaporation is a cooling process. So as the sling psychrometer is spun, um, evaporation happens, evaporation of the water on the wick happens, and that cools the wet bulb thermometer down. Okay, and um, the reading for that thermometer goes down. And the amount of evaporation is related to the relative humidity of the air. The drier the air, the more evaporation that occurs and the lower the wet bulb reading. Okay, so the drier the air, the more evaporation um, that will occur and so the lower the wet bulb reading because the more cooling that happens. The wet bulb temperature is the reading after all of the water has evaporated. All of the water on the wick has evaporated. Um, when that uh, phenomenon is reached, then you can find the wet bulb temperature. So the wet bulb temperature is basically the lowest temperature that can be attained by evaporating water into the air. And the difference between the dry bulb temperature, that's basically the actual air temperature, and the wet bulb temperature tells you about relative humidity. If they are exactly the same, then what is the relative humidity? It's 100%. Because if, they're, because if um, you spin the wet bulb thermometer, okay, and none of the water evaporates at all, in the, then, then that means that the air is completely saturated with water vapor. Okay? But given a certain temperature, the lower the wet bulb reading, the drier the air, the lower the relative humidity. Here's what the sling psychrometer looks like. Okay? Notice that you have two side-by-side -side thermometers, okay? and one of those is dry. The other one has that piece of cloth at the end called the wick, which is dipped into water. And wow, here's your hand, and you're holding it. And So what's going to be done is you're going to spin this sling psychrometer in the air Okay, like a helicopter. Okay. There are un other instruments that are used to measure humidity, such as the hygrometer. The hygrometer uses a material sensitive to, mi to humidity, such as certain metals or hair. And the hair could be from humans, it could be from horses. Okay. The expansion or contraction of that certain material, whether it be um, metal or hair, can give a good measurement of humidity. Okay, If the humidity is higher, that material will expand. If the um, humidity is lower, that material will contract. And what can be done is that material, such as the hair, can be connected to these amplifying levers here. This is the hygrometer, which are then connected to um, this arrow, which basically, which has an ink trace. So as the um, hair expands or contracts, then basically this uh, dial, if you will, goes up or down, and there's ink on it, so you can see the um, humidity changing here on this piece of paper. Okay. Now, 
as we've talked about, relative humidity is um, understood. Excuse me, it's misunderstood to an extent. Okay, it's the most common way to measure humidity in terms of the general, at least the general public knowing about it. Um, okay, so it's talked about on the news. It's what you see on your apps. Okay, but what? As we've talked about, it's relative to temperature, so it doesn't always tell you the tr a true measure of how much water vapor is in the air. M many meteorologists prefer to look at dew point temperature instead because it's a more tr true measure of how much moisture or water vapor is actually in the air. What is dew point temperature? Well, it's the temperature that air would need to be cooled for saturation to occur, assuming no change in air pressure or water vapor content. Okay, so it's how much you'd have to cool the air down, lower the air's temperature, in order to reach saturation, in order to reach um, the temperature where the air has as much water vapor as it can possibly hold. Okay, and again, this assumes you don't change air pressure or the amount of water vapor actually in the air. If you do change the amount of water vapor in the air, that will change the dew point because the dew point is a good indicator of how much water vapor is in the air because it's related to the amount of water vapor in the air. The higher the dew point, folks, the greater the amount of water vapor in the air. The lower the dew point, the less water vapor in the air. It's that straightforward, okay? And um, it does not change unless moisture is added to or removed from the atmosphere. So unlike relative humidity, which has a diurnal cycle, which can change if temperature changes, right? Even if you don't add more moisture or take away moisture out of the air, relative humidity can change, okay, Be um, as temperature changes. Well, dew point, on the other hand, does not change if temperature changes, okay? It only changes if you add more water vapor into the air, in which case it would go up, or you take away water vapor from the air, in which case uh, dew point temperature would decrease. Okay, so as you, so this the reason that um, uh, a lot of meteorologists like to look at dew point temperature is because it's more directly related to the actual amount of water vapor in the air, how sticky the air is. Okay, compared to relative humidity, which is more of a measure of how close the air is in terms of zero to hundred percent, how close the air is to being saturated with water vapor. And, as can be um, inferred from this slide, dew point can be less than temperature, okay? Dew point can be less than temperature because you need to cool the temperature to the dew point temperature to reach saturation. But what if they're equal? When they can also be equal, okay? And when that is the case, do you know what the relative humidity is in terms of a percentage? Well, think, if the temperature is equal to the dew point, that means the air is saturated, right? Because um, you've already reached that point where the temperature's already reached the dew point. It's already reached the temperature where it has to cool to reach saturation. So when they're equal, the air is saturated, which means the relative humidity is 100%. The air is maxed out in terms of water vapor. It can't hold any more, okay? It contains as much water vapor as it can hold at that particular temperature and pressure. And so here's the thing. Except in very short, um, very, very short circumstances, dew point cannot exceed temperature. Because if dew point exceeds temperature, dew point is greater than the air temperature. That means the air has more water vapor in it than it can actually hold at that temperature. So it's super saturated. It has more water vapor than it can hold. In that case, what's going to happen is that the water vapor, the excess water vapor that the air can't hold, will condense out into liquid, and then that will decrease the amount of water vapor in the air back down to um, the um, maximum that the air can actually hold at that temperature, and so then the dew point will equal the temperature. Okay, It won't happen for very long if it does. Generally, temperature... Um, or excuse me, dew point cannot exceed temperature, although it can be it can be less or equal to temperature, okay? But it can't um, exceed it. And if temperature is constant, 
Okay, let's say we have a constant temperature, 65 Fahrenheit. Higher the dew point, the more water vapor in the air. So if the temperature, air temperature is 65 Fahrenheit and the dew point 65 Fahrenheit, we know the air is saturated. Okay, at 65 Fahrenheit, um, we'll talk about what the dew point values mean in, means, mean in terms of how much water vapor is in the air. Okay, is it going to be noticeable? Are you going to be sweating to death? Okay, because none of your sweat's evaporating. Um, but as the dew point decreases, okay, it starts going down, there's less water vapor in the air. So if the air temperature is 65 Fahrenheit and the dew point's 0 Fahrenheit, that would be really dry. And you'd notice that. How do you, what do you notice when the air is really dry? Okay, well, static electricity, right? You can get shocks if you touch your door, a car door handle, okay? Um, what else? Nosebleed in some cases. They are so dry, your nose can bleed. Um, your lips can get chappy, okay? Your hair can get frizzy, okay? These are some um, consequences of low dew points and hence very dry air. What do dew points look like in January and July, win uh, winter time and summertime in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, let's take a look. Here's a figure from the book showing average monthly dew point temperatures across the continental United States and Southern Canada in July. Or excuse me, in January. So this figure shows the average dew point temperatures across the continental U.S. and southern Canada in January. And so as you look at this figure and examine it, do you see any trends? Okay. The solid lines are dew point values in terms of in intervals of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So also what's done is um, intervals of dew point, basically dew, uh, of 10 degrees Fahrenheit, are shaded. Okay, so for example, if the dew point between 0 and 10 Fahrenheit sh is shown by this brown shading. Okay, and the way the shading is done is that the more green and moister looking um, the color the higher the dew point, okay? And whereas, whereas the brown and this pink are supposed to indicate very dry air, okay? So in January, where are dew points highest? Okay, well, southern tip of Florida. Miami has dew, average dew, dew points in July of about 60, 61 Fahrenheit, okay? And that's, that's amazing for January because January is the coldest month in generally in the northern hemisphere um, coldest month of the year in the northern hemisphere and the air is, is cold it's dry because it's cold it can't hold much water vapor and yet Miami because it's so far south um, and it's close to warm bodies of water it still has high dew points from all that evaporation off the Gulf of Mexico, okay, Caribbean Sea, and the air coming in from that, that region, the uh, Atlantic Ocean, and so on. And um, two points along the Gulf Coast are generally um, 40 to 50 Fahrenheit, okay, with, with the higher in southern Florida, okay. And lower dew points are found. Actually, where? Where actually where are the lowest dew points found? Interior Canada, okay? And extending down into the far northern plains of the US, such as Fargo, North Dakota. Average January dew points are less than 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? That's extremely dry here. And the reason the air is so dry in this region here is because it's so cold. And remember what we said? Dew point cannot exceed air temperature, right? So if the air temperature is zero degrees Fahrenheit, the dew point can't be greater than that. Okay, so um, you can start to understand another way how uh, the colder the air, the less water vapor it can hold. Okay, when you examine temperature and dew point, because if the air is really cold, it has to have a low dew point since dew point can only equal the uh, 
or equal or le be less than the temperature, it cannot exceed it. Okay. Dry air is also found in in, t in Nevada. Okay, as you can see here. What do dew point temperatures look like in July? In the continental U.S. and in southern Canada, they look like so. Now, we have um, significantly higher dew points for much of the U.S. Um, as a result of warmer oceans, okay, um, and warmer uh, land and w warmer surfaces on um, of water, um, resulting in more evaporation. Okay, now in this month, again the highest dew points are observed along the Gulf Coast, but they're higher now even, right? So now, actually, not only um, just along the Gulf Coast, but extending inland for a hundred some cases a few hundred miles you have dew points of 70 degrees fahrenheit or greater and we're going to see that these are very high dew points this means very sticky air very uncomfortable air to even um breathe in in for especially for someone like you from if you're from california let alone run in right so the entire state of louisiana the entire state of Mississippi, okay, much of Alabama, much of Georgia, okay, almost all of South Carolina, all of Florida, Florida, have dew, average dew points of um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, okay, in July. And one reason is, um, that you see this kind of northward tongue here, you see that the 70 degrees Fahrenheit dew point line makes it all the way up to near Washington, D.C., it's because of the Gulf Stream, this warm ocean current, bringing warm water um, up the eastern seaboard, and that warm water has a lot of evaporation off it. Okay, so even New York City, even though it's far north, okay, it's at a latitude of around 45 degrees north, which is around the latitude of central to northern Oregon. It still has they have the New York City average dew points in July are in the mid to up mid to upper 60s, and sometimes higher. Okay, probably have heard of how it can be really humid in New York City, okay? Um, there's a saying, it's not the heat, it's the humidity, okay? And the 60 plus Fahrenheit uh, dew points cover nearly the entire eastern half of the country, okay? Which is really interesting. Um, so basically, for almost the entire eastern half of the U.S., they're going to have average July dew points of 60 Fahrenheit or greater. And that doesn't mean it's always that high. Remember, this is these are just averages, okay? Sometimes it'll be higher, sometimes it'll be lower. Different story in the West, though. In fact, for the entire continent of the United States and much of um, Canada, the lowest dew points are actually found over Nevada and eastern Oregon. Um... Partly because this region is protected by mountains. So it's protected from moisture air by the mountains. Okay, um, And you'll see that there is a sliver of Southern California that has average dew points of above 60 Fahrenheit in July. Okay, um, Including LA and San Diego. I will tell you that it is very rare for dew points to exceed about 64 degrees Fahrenheit in the Bay Area, okay? Maybe it happens once a year, maybe a few times a year, okay? It's almost unheard of for Bay Area dew points to get into the upper 60s, okay? Whereas um, for many states in the country, that's that can happen frequently, okay? But California... Um, is near a colder body of water than the eastern half of the country, okay, Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean, because there's a cold ocean current running off um, our coast. And our state of California is also protected from this um, warmer and mo the moister air, moister air from moving west by all these mountains in the um, western third of the country. Okay, the mountains help shield us from that moist air that the Midwest, the East Coast, the Gulf Coast experience. Okay, So, we've been talking about relative humidity and dew point. Okay, They're different. 
Um, I have a question for you, okay? Uh, um, involving a couple e examples of different air masses. We'll be talking about air masses, but they're basically large bodies of air with similar temperature humidity properties. Here on the left, you have some polar air. It's cold. The air temperature is minus two degrees Celsius, twenty-eight degrees Fahrenheit. And the dew point is minus 2 degrees Celsius or 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperature of the air and the dew point are equal. The air temperature and dew point are equal. That means the air is saturated, right? The relative humidity of the air is 100%. It has as much water vapor as it can hold, okay? Now, then you have some desert air, okay? And the air temperature of the desert is 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the dew point is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the relative humidity is only 21%. Okay, and the polar air, by the way, could be over oh the northeast in the northeastern U.S. in January. The desert air might be over southern Cal parts of southeast California, um, southern half of Arizona in the summertime. Okay, maybe in July or August. Okay, which is drier? A or B, which of these two air masses is drier? Okay, how can you tell? If you only looked at relative humidity, let's say, folks, that you weren't given the dew points, okay, and you only looked at relative humidity, okay, it looks like the polar air is more humid because the polar air has a relative humidity of 100%, and the desert air has a relative humidity of only 21%. But I will ask you this question. I'll ask you this question. Which of these two air masses has more water vapor in the air? Does the polar air have more water vapor or the desert air have more water vapor? And how can you tell? Think about that. Pause the video if you need, okay? So the polar air has the higher relative humidity, but the desert air has the higher dew point. Wow. Okay, we're used to thinking about deserts being dry, right? So you have this desert air, you think it's the desert, it's dry, it's a dry heat. Relative humidity is only 21%. But that desert air actually contains significantly more water vapor than the um, quote-unquote damp polar air that's saturated because the dew point is, is significantly higher. So you can see from this example how relative humidity can be very misleading. Okay, And so again, um, dew point is a measure of how much water vapor is in the air. And if you were given air temperature, dew point, and relative humidity for two examples like this, in order to answer the question, what, which um, air mass, or what air, which of these examples of air has a um, more water vapor actually in the air, more moisture in the air, all you have to look at is dew point. That's all you have to look at. Because the higher the dew point, the more water vapor in the air. Okay, So, we can talk about what dew point makes it feel like. Generally, the higher the dew point, the more moisture in the air, and the slower the rate of evaporation. So your sweat would evaporate faster um, on a hot, dry day than a hot, humid day. Given the constant temperature, the um, higher the dew point, the slower the rate of evaporation. Okay. And so here's a nice um, scale showing uh, dew point temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit and how they make um, the air feel in terms of comfort level. Generally, if dew points are below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, it's pleasant. Although, um, this, th this uh, scale focuses more on humidity and moisture air. It doesn't really show you, though, how if the dew point gets too low, actually it can become, um, become uncomfortable. We talked about that. When the dew point starts getting down near 20 or 10, 0 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, then it can be uncomfortable because... Your, again, your lips get chappy. You might, your nose might bleed. Okay, you might get a shock. Right? Is that is a shock, electric shock, comfortable? I don't think so. Okay, so there's that. Okay, 
Um, and if the dew point is in the upper 50s, it's still comfortable, okay? When the dew point exceeds 60 Fahrenheit, when it gets to 61 Fahrenheit, and it and um, that's when a person will start to notice the air is somewhat sticky, okay? Now, and this is relative, you guys, depending on where you're from, right? Whether you're from the California, where it's fairly dry, okay? Um, in terms of dew point, at least, okay? It might not feel dry when it rains, okay? Um, or if you're from uh, a Middle Eastern country or India, where it's it's they have extremely high dew points for much of, for mu for months of the year, you know that's going to affect on how uh, what dew point feels comfortable to you. Okay, but this is kind of a general scale. And the idea is that dew points of 61 through 65 Fahrenheit have air that feels sticky. When the dew point gets into the upper 60s, approaching 70 Fahrenheit. For many people, that's when the dew point, when the air becomes uncomfortably moist, okay, and it, it your your sweat starts having a really hard time evaporating, okay, and so what happens is the reason it starts feeling uncomfortable is because you sweat, but because there's so much moisture in the air, the rate of evaporation of your sweat is slower, and so you don't cool off as fast, okay, and the sweat builds up on your skin. So you're getting sweaty, the sweat's building up, it's not evaporating, and you're not cooling off. Okay? Um, when the dew point exceeds 70 Fahrenheit, now it's in the low 70s, it starts feeling oppressive. And when the dew point gets above six, 75, 76 Fahrenheit, it starts feeling miserable. Okay? It's just hard to even breathe outside. Okay? And for... A city like New Orleans along the Gulf Coast, they might have dew points of 76 Fahrenheit for a few months of the year during the summertime, okay? And so it's amazing, you know, God bless those people that live on the Gulf Coast, right? Um, for someone like myself from, I live most of my life in California, Northern California, okay, NorCal, hella NorCal, okay? Um, it's it would be hard for me to, you know, probably like even be outside in that type of humidity, let alone exercise, okay, because I'm an avid runner, okay, and maybe you are too, okay, maybe not, but everyone has their different things, right, so, um, you now understand how uh, more moisture in the air makes it feel more un uncomfortable, and it can make it feel hotter than it really is, okay, so, to address the issue of um, heat and humidity to com uh, heat and humidity combining to produce not only uncomfortable but sometimes very dangerous conditions. An index was developed um, that accounts for the combination of these two factors, and it's known as the heat index. Okay, the heat index is basically the apparent temperature due to a combination of the air temperature itself, and um, the humidity, such as can, as can be represented by dew point. So we saw a wind chill chart in lecture um, four. Here's a heat index chart. On the vertical axis, you start at the top 140 degrees Fahrenheit air temperature, which is hotter than it's ever been on the surface of Earth, to be honest, right, to be fair. And as you go down, your air temperature decreases, okay? Dew point temperature is shown on this horizontal axis, and as you go to the right, it increases, okay? And the shading refers to the danger of um, the combination of heat and humidity, okay? And some of the consequences, okay? So, um, as an example... Okay, of say the type of heat and humidity that the Gulf Coast has to deal with. On a given day in the summertime, the um, air temperature might be 90 degrees Fahrenheit in a certain city in a state like Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida. 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But the dew point might be, oh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the heat index will be 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? And 
you should use extreme caution when you're when the heat index is between 90 degrees and 105 degrees Fahrenheit okay so the shadings refer to how dangerous the combinations of heat and humidity are when the ex when the heat index is between 80 to 90 Fahrenheit you should just be on the lookout because fatigue is possible with prolonged exposure um, to the conditions, the heat and humidity, and or physical activity like running, bicycling, even walking. Okay, When the heat index gets between 90 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, so it actually feels like 90 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit outside, sunstroke, cramping, okay, we've seen this with football players playing in hot weather, right? Um, heat exhaustion are possible with prolonged exposure and or physical activity. Heat indexes or heat indices of 105 to 129 degrees Fahrenheit result in dangerous conditions. Sunstroke, cramping of muscles and or heat exhaustion are not po just possible, now they're likely. They're likely. And heat stroke, which is much more dangerous than heat exhaustion, is possible with prolonged exposure and or physical activity. If the heat index gets to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, a staggeringly high number, heat stroke is now likely and heat stroke can be deadly. It's very dangerous, okay? Um, and this sometimes, um, it's rare for heat indices to get this high, but this can happen in certain um, places in the Middle East where the air temperature might be 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the dew point might start exceeding 80 degrees Fahrenheit even, okay? Um, so, this is the heat, this is um, the heat index chart, okay? Let's talk about dew. On long nights with clear skies and calm winds, okay? which, as you can see, not, those nights favor strong radiational cooling. Areas close to the ground can rapidly cool to the dew point. So if the air temperature drops to the dew point at nighttime, that means now the air has as much water vapor as it can hold. The relative humidity has reached 100%. Any further cooling of the temperature below the dew point will result in water condensing out and think about this you can understand why this would happen if the temperature drops to the dew point okay relative humidity is 100 percent air has as much water vapor as it can hold right well what did we say Temp dew point cannot exceed temperature so if temperature drops below any more below the dew point now the air can no longer hold that extra water vapor it, it, so be, and because the air had as much water vapor as it can ha hold, ha hold, and now it's further cooling, it can't hold as much anymore, that excess water vapor has to condense out. And so it can do so on grass, it can do so on car windshields, it can do so on mailboxes, okay? And so you will see sometimes dew forming um, on um, certain surfaces on long winter nights with clear skies and light winds, okay? Which produce good radiational cooling conditions. If the dew point is below freezing, less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the water vapor, the excess water vapor, can turn directly into ice on the surface. That's deposition, which can form frost. Okay, And so this can happen in San Jose, right? Snow is extremely rare in San Jose, but it is possible to have a white Christmas in San Jose in terms of frost. Okay, So... It, it can um, ice can form basically on surfaces without any clouds in the sky, right? From um, frost. Okay. It won't it won't be as deep as snow. It won't be as pretty as snow. But I'm you, I'm sure you've seen frost. How frost can make the ice the grass look white. Okay, it can cover the grass in a kind of a white coating. Um, here's a picture from the book showing some close a close up of some grass blades okay and you can see these little droplets of water those those are drops of dew okay now you're starting to understand where that term dew point comes from right it's the temperature to which the the um it's the temperature that 
would allow dew to form if any further cooling occurred. Okay, and like as we said, if the dew point is below freezing, frost may form. This picture from the book shows delicate ice crystal patterns um, that um, you can see if you examine frost under a microscope. Okay, And here's a, a larger scale picture of frost covering grass. Now, remember we were talking about aerosols, um, uh, pollution, okay, visibility, haze. What's haze? It's kind of a layer that of um, particles that reduces visibility. When the relative humidity reaches around 75%, meaning the air has about it's about three quarters saturated with water vapor. Water vapor can actually start to condense on certain cloud condensation nuclei that are hygroscopic, which means water seeking. Hygroscopic nuclei allow condensation to occur at substantially lower relative humidities than 100%. And so when the relative humidity gets to around 75%, um, and there's enough particles in the air that can act as CCN, like salt particles, dust particles, smoke particles, water vapor can start condensing on the more hygroscopic ones, the ones that uh, seek water. Okay. And as water vapor collects and condenses onto these particles, the size of the droplets increase and eventually the droplets can become large enough to scatter light forming haze particles okay now if the relative humidity becomes close to 100 percent more and more vapor molecules condense okay because when the relative humidity is 75 percent only the more hygroscopic water seeking ccn allow condensation Station. But if the relative humidity gets to 100%, water vapor can condense onto all CCN. Any, okay, And so then the droplets get even larger because you have more condensation. So now the droplets become large enough um, and you have enough of them for their mass to form something that is visible to the naked eye. That's a cloud. A cloud is a collection of liquid droplets and or ice crystals kind of looking at the liquid droplet part of the cloud here but liquid droplets and or ice crystals in great enough concentration and volume to see with the naked eye okay some clouds form high in the atmosphere thin wispy clouds high in the atmosphere um if the clouds are high enough they will only be made of ice because remember how on average for every 1000 feet you ascend in the troposphere, air temperature drops 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? But others form right on the ground. What do we call a cloud on the ground? Fog. Fog is a stratus cloud on the ground. Well, now you know one of the uh, cloud types, stratus. Let's learn the others. You are going to learn the names of the clouds, okay? What they look like, what whether they can produce precipitation, how they interact with different types of radiation, okay?